I'll tell you a story, a couple of stories as we start to set up the message. Um, our oldest son, when he was little, was really weird. Well, he still is, but he was, <laughs> he's, he's 40 now, but he was really weird when he was little. And, and uh, when our, one day my parents came to the door to our house, and uh, he answered the door. His name's Kyle, and Kyle answered the door. And, and uh, he opened it, and he says to my parents, it's Double Dare, and I took the physical challenge. Now, if you may not remember this, there was a show on TV called Double Dare, and the kids would, they'd either have to do something, or they'd take the physical challenge, they'd have to do something weird. And they didn't know what he meant until he led them into the kitchen. And he had, in our kitchen, taken all the Cool Whip he could find, and he'd smeared it all over the kitchen floor, and he was ice skating across the kitchen floor on the Cool Whip. And he looked up at my mom, they called her nanny, and he said, I couldn't find the cherries, nanny. And so we were grateful for that anyway, but that's the kind of stuff he did. I mean, I mean that was, it was routine. Well, one night, this is when I'm still playing, I got home, and I was, I've been a night owl my whole life, and I got home, and I was sitting at my desk doing some work. It's after a ball game. It was late, at, pro- at least midnight, and he should be in bed asleep. And I hear a noise behind me, and I look, and there's Kyle. He's fully dressed. He has a backpack on, clothes hanging out of it, snacks hanging out of it. And I looked at him, and I said, uh, hmm. And he said, see you, Dad. What do you mean, see you? What are you, what are you doing? He said, I'm running away. <laughs> and I said, just a minute. And so I turned back, and I looked at my desk and pretended I was working. And I'm thinking, Lord, my, um, my four-year-old is saying he's going to run away, and, and he appears to be equipped for the journey. Uh, you know, what do I do? And I, I thought for a moment. Now, at the time, we lived in champ, old champions on the golf course. And behind our house, there was nothing. There, wasn't no, there were no homes across the golf course. It was, it was like at least a half a mile behind us, maybe a mile where there was nothing. And so I said, okay, come with me. And I walked him to the back door. And we got to the back door, and I opened it. And I said, see ya. <laughs> and he stepped out on the back porch, and he took a step or two. And then he said... Hey, Dad, I, I think I'll wait till tomorrow morning to run away. <laughs> now, how foolish would it have been for a four-year-old to run away from his father and his home in the middle of the night like that? How foolish would that be? But the parable we look at today, something more foolish than that is demonstrated by Jesus to us in this parable. I, I want you to look at some pictures with me, and there, I'll make a point from these. Look at, the, look at the view in these pictures. Beautiful, beautiful views. And just, what do you see in common, by the way, as you look at all these views? Look at the beautiful, aren't they? Beautiful views. Fantastic. Just absolutely stunning, breathtaking, wonderful views. What do you notice in common about every one of those views? Yeah, every one of those views, what, you're looking through a window to see that beautiful view. And that's what we've said about these parables, that parables are windows so we can see uh, uh, things of the kingdom of God and truths about God and who he is. Well, I will tell you in this parable today, the view through this window is so much more beautiful than any of those uh, far beyond what we can imagine in a beautiful, beautiful view. So we've been looking, if you're new, we've been looking at the parables of Jesus. And we've said and we've defined them as parables are simple, earthly stories, things about simple stories on this planet, on this earth. But they have profound heavenly meanings. Profound meanings about the kingdom of God and things about God himself. Last week we started looking at Luke 15, remember? And we talked about that Luke 15 begins because the religious elite are complaining Because Jesus is hanging out and receiving and even having meals with the greatest sinners of all, with the tax collectors and the center of all sinners, if you will. and They don't like it at all. And then Jesus, out of that uh, response to those people complaining about him hanging out with sinners, told a parable. And remember, it's actually three parables in one. He said, he told them this parable, but this parable had three parables. And last week we looked at first the lost sheep. Remember that Shepherd has a hundred sheep, one gets away, he leaves the 99 and he goes and saves the one. And when he finds it, he puts it over his shoulders and brings it home rejoicing. And there's great celebration. And then the second one was the woman who lost one of her 10 coins in the house. And she looks diligently and finds that coin. And when she does, she calls her friends and neighbors together and she rejoices. And she's found that, she's found that coin. 
And, and the idea is, and the whole outline was, remember, there's something of value is lost. The owner or the responsible party goes seeking that thing to find it, to rescue it. And then when they find it, there's great celebration because of finding of this lost thing. Well, Jesus continues that parable today. We look at the next phase of the parable, which is still part of it. And this one's about not just one son. It's really about two sons, even though today we're just going to look at the younger son, the first son in this story. Uh, The first two parables we looked at really emphasize God seeking lost sinners, right? And and the seeking of God and the the shepherd, the seeking the sheep, and then, then the woman seeking for that coin. This one has a little different emphasis, a little different aspect, because it talks about man's sin and then uh, a man's, if you will, rejection, turning away from God and doing his own thing, and then repentance, and then a return to God. And it is a moving story of a sinner's true repentance and a return to the Father. We, we know the story as the story of the prodigal son. And you've heard it taught many times, so don't tune me out. Don't say, I know this story, because you probably do. Most of you do. But I hope we'll see it in a whole new light. I hope we'll look through this parable after this morning and we look through this window of the parable and we'll see it in a whole new light and a whole new understanding. And I will tell you right up front, everything I say is pointing toward one moment at the very end of the sermon. So we'll have the proper view through this window, if you will. Um, So after the lost sheep and the lost coin, Jesus continues. Here's what it says. This begins in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, remember the culture that Jesus is speaking into and giving us this parable is a culture of honor and shame. It's a culture about doing things that bring honor to your village, to your, to your home, to your family, to your father. And it's a culture where you don't want to bring shame to any of these places. You just don't want to do that. When when the father would have died, this younger son would have received one-third of the estate. That's what would have happened. And the older son would have received two-thirds of the estate. But the operative word there is when the father died. But in this case, one commentator made a point that in a Middle Eastern culture, uh, this culture of honor and shame, if you will, to ask for the inheritance while the father was still alive was basically the same thing as saying to your father, I wish you were dead. I wish you weren't here, I wish you were dead, and I had my part of the inheritance right now. And a traditional Middle Eastern father would have been expected to drive his son out of the house, both verbally and physically, when something like that took place. Now, think about it for a moment. Think about the position. Put yourself in the position of this father. What was he forced to do if he was going to comply with the son's wishes? He was going to have to liquidate a third of his estate some way. Jesus didn't give us the details, but just imagine in that culture... And the guy evidently had some wherewithal in Jesus' story, so he would have had to maybe sold some of his land or perhaps some of his livestock in in order to give the son a third uh, of the estate. Not only that, it's the absolute humiliation the father would have faced because of the son's rebellion and the son's wanting to go away. Everyone in town would have known it, and this Middle Eastern culture, it would have been a big deal, and it would have brought great, great humiliation and great shame to this father. But most of all, and think about in the context of the parable itself, this son was saying, I want out of here. I don't want to live under your roof anymore. I don't want to live under your authority anymore. I want to live without family. I'm gone. I'm out of here. It's like my little son wanting to leave, but in a great, much, much, much greater way. Of all the stories Jesus could have told to show us the essence of sin, he, I mean, he, could, he could have given us a story about a murderer or a story about a thief, a story about a rapist. He could, he could have talked about a lot of different people and telling us about the essence of sin, but he didn't. He chose a story about a son saying to his father, I don't want to live under your authority anymore. I want out of here. Let me live my own life. Let me go my own way. Let me do my own thing. And if you think of it in the context, it's a picture of what We do when we ignore God and live our lives apart from God. It's a great picture of that. I want to do things on my own. It's all about, look at it in our culture, it's all about me, me, me. And that's what this young son did. I want out of here. I want what's mine. That's the picture. And then Jesus continues with the story. 
Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this young son, however he did it quickly, takes the inheritance from his father, the third of the estate, and he converts it to some form where he can carry it with him. He does that quickly, and then he heads off for a far country, and there he goes to live his own life away from his father doing his own thing. And in Jesus' story, I want to keep reminding you, this is Jesus' story to us to teach us some things. But in this story, he squanders his estate. He squanders his wealth. That word squanders means he wastes it. He spent it in such a way that there was no chance, there was no investment involved. He spends it in such a way so there's no chance for a return to come back to him. It is wasted, and when it's spent, it is gone. And, when it, and, when, and we've wasted everything... Sooner or later, it's all gone, right? It's going to run out. And whenever we waste it all, sooner or later, famine is going to follow, just like it did in his life. This is true materially. It's true emotionally. It's true spiritually. When we've spent everything, famine's going to follow. He becomes so desperate. Remember the Jesus story. He becomes so desperate, he goes out and, and gets a job feeding pigs. Now, think about Jesus' audience, the Jews here in the story. You cannot picture something lower than a young Jewish guy out feeding pigs until Jesus says he was so hungry he was wanting to eat the food that the pigs were eating. And then in verse 16, just verse 16 so important, listen, but no one gave him anything. This is true of the young son, it's true for you and me today. In the far country, no one has anything to offer. There's no one there to help, there's no one there to give you uh, real help and real answers to the issues of your life. You can't find them in the far country. It is not there. And there's that old saying that's so true in this parable, sin always overpromises, and sin always underdelivers. You know that's true. Sin always overpromises, and it always underdelivers. If we're living in a world, if you're living in a world apart from God today, there is no help there. There is no one there with real answers, not in this world apart from God. But now the story that Jesus gives us takes a dramatic turn, turn and it gets really good. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. It, that phrase, when he came to his senses, what does this suggest? It, it suggests he was living without sense, right? He was living a life totally crazy, totally senseless. He, he was in a far country, starving to death, and living without thought of his father or without thought of home. Listen, the thoughts of a godless man are characterized by a forgetfulness of God and who he is and what he wants to do in your life and in my life. We are living without sense when we live our lives day to day without thought of God and the everyday issues of our lives. Do you, when you live your life each week, I'm not talking about on Sunday morning, but when you live your life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, how much thought do you give to God and his impact in your life and on your life and the decisions you make and the things you do and the priorities of your life? It is senseless, foolish, to live without thought of God. There's an insanity to this kind of life, but sin blinds us. Sin blinds us to the truth and what's going on. But something in the desperation of his life, and we can learn from this, but something in the desperation of this young man's life woke him up and he began to come to his senses. I read one writer this week I really liked, so I'm ripping this off. This is not original with me. I wish it was. I wish I was this bright, but I love what he did. 
He took an acrostic and he said this young man had an aha moment. A-H-A. First, he had an awakening. He had a sudden awakening. He begins to think. He starts to think correctly and he begins to remember his father and he remembers his home. And he knows it's better to serve at home than to reign in the far country. Freedom here has become slavery and service at home was really freedom. Boy, we get that messed up, thinking that serving under the authority of God is slavery, is complete freedom. We see it in the story. A is for awakening. H is for honesty. We see his brutal honesty. When he comes to his senses and wakes up, there's a brutal honesty. He owns his sin. He says, I have sinned. It's easy to say. It's easy for me to say to you on Sunday morning, we're all sinners. That's easy for me to say. It's easy for you to say we're all sinners. It's a lot harder when we have sinned to stand up and say, I have sinned. Do you hear the difference in those two things? And he says, I have sinned. It's one of the most difficult things for us to say. Now, his intention in the parable was to say to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. That was his intention. He saw himself as he really was. He understood that he was a sinner, and he, and he owned it. Now, at this point, his hope to be, become a son again is gone. He's thinking now, I just want to go back and become a day laborer. And he's probably thinking, I could probably pay my dad back. I'll go back and be a laborer for him, and I'll earn the money, and I'll pay him back, and I'll, I'll be okay. But I'm just going to go be a laborer for him. So he has an awakening. He has honesty. And the next H, or next day stands for action. He has immediate action. Listen to verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. It's a beautiful picture of repentance, of what real repentance looks like. Real repentance involves three things. Number one, it involves a coming to your senses, just like with this young man. When the circumstances of life so pull on us, so begin to tear the fabric of our lives that we realize we're coming apart, and, and we start to think right, and we start to say, man, what am I doing here? What was I thinking? This is not where I belong. Life shouldn't be like this. God did not mean to intend for me to live this way. We're beginning to come to our senses. What in the world was I thinking? Repentance involves coming to your senses. Secondly, it involves a vertical repentance. Repentance is, first of all, vertical. In his prayer that he's going to pray to his father when he comes home, he, he says, I have sinned against heaven. He said, I've sinned against God. In doing this, I've sinned against the very heart of God. Now, now why is that so important? Think, think about it in Scripture. Where have we heard this before? Probably the classic example for you and me is the life of David, remember? And by the way, the life of David and his great sin with Bathsheba, and he, he committed adultery with her, stole Uriah's wife, and then set up the circumstances for Uriah to be killed. So he's guilty of adultery. He's guilty, guilty of murder. And by the way, that's one of the greatest parables in the Old There are some parables in the Old Testament. And that's one of them when God sends Nathan the prophet. Remember, to confront David, he used a parable to confront David. But in Psalm 51, in David's confession of his sin, Remember what he says? He says, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. This will be on the screen. And then he says to God, against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And here's David praying, against you, you only, I've sinned, God. And, and when I read that, and as a young person in particular, I'm thinking, against you only have I sinned. What about Uriah? You, you committed adultery with the guy's wife and you had him killed. But, but David had it right. The point is our, our confession and our repentance begins when we understand that we've, we've sinned against the very heart of God and hurt the very heart of God and our, sentences, our, our, our repentance is first vertical. God, I've sinned against you. I had a teammate many years ago and he was uh, making some bad decisions relationship-wise. And I knew him, I knew his family, knew his wife, and I, on a road trip I took him to lunch to confront him about it. And in the course of the confrontation, um, he was very sorry about the pain he was experiencing. 
and he, he regretted the pain he was experiencing. But, you know, think about it. If all you regret is the pain you're experiencing, that's just another deeper form of selfishness. He didn't regret that he had hurt the very heart of God. And his confession wasn't there. And because it was never there, he never repented of his sin and he never got it right. And it cost him a whole lot in his life. Repentance is first vertical, but it's also horizontal. Thirdly, repentance is horizontal. And so the young man doesn't just say, I've sinned against heaven. He says to his father, and I've sinned in your sight as well. And so that's the picture. Sin is also horizontal, and we repent for the people that we've hurt. And he does in this case. You will know you're really serious about repentance and the sin in your life when you stop making excuses for it. When you and I stop making excuses for our sin, we're ready to repent and deal with it. So repentance is coming to our senses. It's vertical, first with God and then horizontal with the people we've hurt. And that's what this young man's ready to do. Now, what kind of reception do you think this young man is expecting when he gets home? What's he expecting to happen when he goes home? There's some historical context here that's, that's important to understand. When a Jewish boy like this would take the estate of his family and go and waste the estate with uh, in the area with Gentiles, there would be a, a ceremony that the villagers would be ready to perform when he came home. It was called the Kazaza. And the Kazaza would, would be, he, this person would come home hoping to be back and hoping to be reinstated. And the village would meet him and somebody, some leader there would have a, a, a clay jar, a clay pot. And when he walked in, they would throw it on the ground and break it. And when it broke, they would pick up a piece of that and say, this is the brokenness of your life. This is the hurt you've caused. This is the, you're, you've hurt your father's heart. You've hurt this village. You've hurt everything about us. This is you. You are no longer welcome here. In fact, the word, the Hebrew word means a cutting off. And that's a picture. And probably the young boy expected, young man expected some kind of reception like that. It could have well been on his mind. So he heads home, not knowing exactly what to expect, but that's probably part of it. But he knows it's better than starving to death in the far country. He's come to his senses. Now I want you to look at three things. First, look at the welcome. Verse 20, the second part of it. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, now don't miss this. It, while he was, Scripture says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Even after all his son had done, evidently the father never stopped watching for him. Because when he was way off, his father saw him. Now, someone will look different. Think about it. He's, he's been starving to death, literally. Wanted to eat the food from the pigs. He would have looked totally different. Leaving a home where he'd been loved and cared for, and now he's wasted everything, and he comes back. But yet, something about the way he walked down that road, the father recognized him. Maybe today, the father's thinking, maybe today my son will come home. And that's his thought. That's my boy. That's my son coming now, clearly, this father wasn't like me, and probably like most of you. He had not rehearsed a three-point lecture when the son came home. And that's what we would have done, isn't it, most of us? We would have had a three-point lecture, but that's not what he does at all. As soon as he saw his son, Scripture says, he felt compassion for his son, and he ran and embraced him. And you know, in this culture, this honor-shame culture, for a grown man to run like this, wearing these long robes, was considered a shameful thing. It, it was in that same culture... <laughs> and that shame and honor culture for this man to run down the road to meet his son was considered shameful, but he didn't care because his son was coming home. And I love what some, some of the commentators say, perhaps this father wanted to run to his son and meet him before the villagers would see him and could perform that kazaza where they throw down the pottery and say, you're not welcome here. No, he runs to his son and he welcomes him home and he throws his arms around him and he kisses him on the neck repeatedly. And it's a sign of affection, but it's also a sign, of, a sign of forgiveness. Secondly, notice the interrupted prayer. I like this. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's the prayer. But notice he doesn't get to finish his prayer. 
I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And at that point, the father broke in. The son intended to say more. The son intended to say to his father, Father, I I don't deserve to be your son. I haven't earned it. I've lost my right to do that. I want to come back and work for you. Perhaps I can win my way back. Perhaps I can pay my way back, which, by the way, we can never pay our way back. Perhaps these things. That's what he wanted to say. Make me, remember, he wanted the last part of the prayer was make me like one of your hired men. But he never got to say that. The father broke in and said, no, no. When he said, I have sinned, he had said enough. That's the picture. I have sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He was allowed to say that. But then the father broke in and that was it. This was, this was not some little story that Jesus gave us of a, of a son coming home, saying all the right words, pulling all the right strings so his father would love him again and welcome him home. That's not the picture at all. This is a picture of true repentance. I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. But the father knew he could never pay back what he had done. That wasn't the point. He won his place on his father's chest again because of the Father's love and mercy and grace toward him. Not because of anything he could ever do to earn that position of his Father hugging him and welcoming home. It was purely his grace. Third thing here is the reinstatement. And I'm not going to talk much about this because we're going to pick up the message there next week. I'll read you the verses, but we'll, we'll look at them closer next week. But the Father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Picking up every week, this has been a part of that. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. He was lost. He was found. And so they began to celebrate. Now let me remind you of this whole chapter and the whole story. Let me remind you of how it began because I want to go to that one picture I told you I want us all to have when we finish the message today. This whole chapter began, and I'll read them to you, the first two verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Remember, that's the greatest sinners of all. They were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes and eats with sinners. And in response, he says to them, you don't know why I hang out with sinners because you have no idea what my father's like. That's what he's saying to them. Now, look through the window of the parable. Look through the window, what's he saying? When any sinner comes to their senses and gets up and comes home, the Heavenly Father will run to meet them and welcome them home. Now, look through the window. What's the view through the window? What do you see? If you get here and look through the window, what do you see? Here's what I want you to hear today. If you remember nothing else, but remember this. This parable is not the parable of the prodigal son. That's thinking about it wrong. Look through the window of this parable, and this is the parable of the father's heart. When you look through this window, you see the Father's heart. You know, Tozer said, I think it was Tozer that said, the most important thing about you is what you think when you think about God. And that's a great statement. And when you see this window, you see the Father heart of God. You see his heart. Remember, whose story is this? Who gave us this parable? Jesus. This is Jesus telling us who the Father is. And this is what the Father heart of God looks like. And what that means today is wherever you are, whatever you've done, whoever you are, if you will have an aha moment, when you awake from where you are, when you're honest, a brutal honesty, I have sinned, and you take action and get up and come home, what's going to happen? You have a Father heart of God ready to run to meet you today, this morning, and welcome you home and throw his arms around you and kiss you. That's who he is. One of my favorite things about this, and I didn't think about it, I was thinking about it this morning. 
we look through this parable and we see the heart of God and we get a clean window now and we see what the Father heart of God looks like. But you know, something else that's really important, it's not just what you think about God, but when you look through this window, it's clean and, 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 and God sees you. You know, you know what else it shows you? It shows you what God thinks about you. <laughs> the parable shows what God thinks about you. He knows where you are. He knows where I am. He knows we're in the far country. And, it, and if we will have a true repentance and come home, Father heart of God values you so much that's why he gets up and runs home to meet you, because he wants to welcome you home. I, I didn't want my little guy to run away. Obviously, I didn't. But if he had, I'd have been looking for him. And if he had come home, I would have welcomed him home. That's how God sees you. And if you will come to your senses and acknowledge your sin and stop making excuses and come to him today, <laughs> the Father will run to you and throw his arms around you and say, welcome home. I'm glad you're here.